Hey everyone, this is Christian and welcome to Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. This is a Very Normal Therapeutics employee training video. The topic of this video is the generalized linear model. Before I start, I have some bad news. The earnings for Very Normal Therapeutics were not great this quarter. So Very Normal Therapeutics is actually shutting its doors at the end of the year. But since this was a fictional company, it only really affects me. But this means no more employee training videos. No! My goal for this series was to cover the main tools that are taught to a first year master's students in the biostatistics program. Generalized linear models are actually the last topic I'd planned for this series. But I still have a lot to say about statistics, so I'm not going anywhere. I just thought it was a good time for me to start exploring new ways to get more people into statistics. Business admin aside, let's get started. GLMs are models for relationships between variables. If you don't know what I'm talking about, here's a quick refresher. We have a dependent variable or outcome Y, and we want to see how another variable X, which we'll call covariate, influences this outcome. From past videos, we saw that linear regression allowed us to work with continuous outcomes, while logistic regression allowed us to work with binary outcomes. Continuous and binary outcomes are probably the most commonly studied types of outcomes. But there are still others that would be useful for us to study. For example, there are count outcomes. Think number of accidents or number of hospital visits. In biostatistics, time to event outcomes are incredibly important. An example that we all know is how much time we have left to live. What makes these outcomes different from continuous or binary outcomes is the possible values that they can take. Count outcomes can only be whole numbers, and time to event outcomes can only be positive real numbers. We could try to model both of these with the normal distribution, but these ultimately would only be approximations. We can get better approximations by respecting the constraints on the values these outcomes can take. I've previously framed linear and logistic regression as two similar but distinct models. Two outcome types, two models. But now that we're considering even more outcome types, it's worth taking a step back and thinking about how we could create a framework that encompasses not just continuous and binary outcomes, but also count and time to event. If this framework has nice properties, then these nice properties would extend to any model that comes out of it. This framework is the Generalized Linear Model or GLM. People often think about statistics as just existing, like they've always been there for us to use. But statistical models themselves are inventions. And just like any invention, it could become popular and eventually see widespread use. GLMs were introduced by statisticians John Nelder and Robert Wedderburn in a 1972 paper simply titled Generalized Linear Models. This makes GLMs younger than my own parents, which is kind of crazy to say out loud. Nowadays, GLMs are a mainstay in statistics education and help drive a lot of research that's published today. A GLM is made of three components. First, an outcome that is assumed to come from a special set of probability distributions called an exponential family. We'll get back to this in a bit. You can call the outcome the random component. Second, one or more covariates that might have a relationship with the outcome. Instead of considering each covariate separately, we combine them into a linear model. This model allows us to separate the effects of each covariate while combining them all into a single convenient value. This linear model is called the systematic component. Even though the covariates themselves can be seen as random variables, we usually consider them to be fixed values instead. And three, a special function that relates the random component with the systematic component. This function is called the link function, and its importance will become clear soon. Now that you know about the parts of a GLM, let's take a closer look. I said that the outcome needs to come from an exponential family. What is that? An exponential family is any set of probability distributions that can be written with the following structure. Okay, I know that's a lot of notation, but stay with me. I'm going to shine a light on what's important about this expression. First, notice on the left-hand side that there's a theta. In statistics, theta is commonly used to denote a general parameter. In other words, it indicates that an exponential family is parametric. This is important because it conveniently describes the entire shape of the distribution with just a few numbers. For the normal distribution, this is the mean mu and variance sigma squared. For the binomial distribution, the parameter is usually the probability of success pi. Since the outcome could be one of many possible distributions, it's just easier to use theta to represent this general parametric characteristic. Second, I want to point out that an exponential family is composed of four distinct functions. These two functions are a function of only the outcome, indicated by the sole y argument here. 
Likewise, these two functions are functions of only the parameter theta. These three functions here need to be inside of the exponential function, which gives the family its name. Notice that this expression here is a product of two functions. If this were instead a function of both the outcome and the parameter, then we wouldn't have an exponential family. They need to be able to be written in this product form. The exponential family requirement sounds like a scary technical detail, but it's really not. It's more an exercise in picking a particular distribution. To drive this home, here's a list of the most commonly used exponential families in a GLM. You probably recognize a few of these. These distributions essentially cover most of the types of outcomes we'd be interested in. I'm not going to go into detail here, but exponential families also have a lot of convenient mathematical properties. For your purposes, it's enough to know that many popular distributions are also exponential families and thus can be used in a GLM. But you might wonder, huh, this is the binomial distribution I learned in school and it doesn't look anything like an exponential family. But with some mathematical manipulation, you can give it the form you would expect from one. You can pause the video to confirm this on your own time if you'd like. Based on this equivalent expression of the binomial distribution, you can see the elements of the exponential family. We have to assume that the number of trials n is fixed, but this is an assumption we typically make. Therefore, the binomial distribution is in fact an exponential family. If you've watched my logistic regression video, you may recognize something. The log odds here. We normally think of the binomial distribution as being parameterized by pi, but in its exponential family form, you could consider this entire expression as a parameter in and of itself. The particular function we get from converting into exponential family form has a special name, the natural parameter. With logistic regression, we saw that the linear model influences the outcome through the log odds. From the perspective of a GLM, you'd say that the systematic component influences the natural parameter. But we can take advantage of the fact that the natural parameter and the original parameter are related by a function that can be inverted. That is, once the natural parameter is changed, we can convert this change back in terms of the original parameter. The logit transform links the systematic component to the random component, so we call it the link function for the binomial distribution. That being said, it's possible to have several link functions available for a family. For logistic regression, we can use other links like the probit link or the complementary log log link, but to be honest, I haven't really seen them used in my experience. The function that comes from converting a distribution into its exponential family form has a special name, the canonical link function. We get the logit transform from doing this to the binomial distribution, so that's the canonical link. For a second GLM example, let's see how they can be used for count outcomes. This particular model is also known as Poisson regression, the Poisson distribution is typically written in the following form. The parameter of the Poisson distribution is usually denoted as lambda, and you can think of it as representing a rate. Let's say that the outcome y is the number of comments I get on a YouTube video. If I choose to look at the number of comments that come in a single hour, then lambda can be interpreted as the number of comments per hour. It's up to the analyst to choose the timescale they want to work on. In its exponential family form, the Poisson distribution looks more like this. From this perspective, you can easily see the natural parameter of the Poisson distribution, the log of the rate, or log rate for short. You'd also say that the link function is the log link. Based on this link, you can deduce that the covariates will influence the outcome through the log rate. Thus, the full model is that the outcome is a Poisson random variable with the following rate parameter. All these together form a GLM using the Poisson distribution as the outcome distribution. Instead of a single lambda parameter, we have two regression parameters. These represent how the covariates influence the outcome, so a natural question is to ask, how do we interpret them? To answer that, we need to look at the relationship between the natural parameter, log lambda, and the linear predictor. For simplicity, we'll assume that we have a binary covariate indicating whether or not a video thumbnail has my face on it. One means my face is on the thumbnail, and zero means it doesn't. Some of you asked for non-biostatistics examples, so this is what you get. When my face isn't on the thumbnail, we only have beta zero in the linear predictor. So beta zero is the log rate of YouTube comments on a video with the thumbnail that doesn't have my face on it. To isolate beta one, we need to do some mathematical manipulation similar to what we did in the linear and logistic regression videos. I'm not gonna bore you with the math. What you'll get in the end is that beta one represents the log rate ratio. 
With some more manipulation, we can get this expression. E raised to beta 1 describes how having my face on the video thumbnail changes the common rate on a multiplicative scale. For instance, if beta 1 was negative 0.22, then E raised to negative beta 1 would be about 80%. This result indicates that my face decreases the common rate by about 20%, which probably makes sense. The reverse logic works if beta 1 is positive. I hope this helps explain how GLMs can be used to accommodate a wider variety of outcomes. To wrap up this video, we'll quickly implement a Poisson regression in R. First, we'll simulate some data based on the YouTube comment example I gave earlier. I'll simulate 50 binary observations here to represent the indicator of whether or not a thumbnail has my face on it. From here, we'll use this covariate to generate the log rate for the outcome. We'll give thumbnails without my face a log rate of 1, and we'll pretend that having my face decreases the log rate by half. Finally, we'll generate the count outcome based off these parameters. From there, you can use the GLM function to create the GLM and estimate the model coefficients, just like we did with logistic regression. Since we're modeling the outcome with the Poisson distribution, you need to specify Poisson in the family argument instead. Running this allows R to estimate the regression parameters through maximum likelihood, and we can look at a summary for it with the summary function. You can see here that the estimated parameters are pretty close to the true values. GLMs greatly expand our ability to examine the relationships between variables, and this is why they're one of the most used tools in statistics. I hope that you've enjoyed my series of explainer videos. I learned a lot making these, and I hope that I can keep improving as a statistics educator. If you liked what you saw, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I try to release statistics content every two weeks. If you sign up for the channel newsletter, you can also get my videos sent directly to your inbox. You'll see what's going on behind the scenes with me and the channel, and see what I'm doing to try to improve myself as a creator. That's it for this one. Happy holidays. I'll see you in the next one.